Well, hi again, everybody. James Raffin here. Uh, to the 1108 of you who um, registered for the first episode in this series, I want to say thank you. You met uh, Jimbo there, who's a character who lives here in Sealy's Bay. And um, if you're wondering where Jimbo is, I'm, uh, I'm happy to tell you that he's still right here in the Isolatorium on the shores of Cranberry Lake. I want to take you into a second episode in this series that is called Ice Walker. And in order to set the frame of this episode, I want to go back to um, Circling the Midnight Sun because there was a, an idea that, that emerged at the end of that project that has profoundly shaped not only my view of the world, but also um, uh, the, the way in which uh, stories emerge in my consciousness and in, in the telling. So in Circling the Midnight Sun, um, having lived and traveled with many Northerners over a long period of time, but for that journey over three years, traveling around the world, I, I, the image that kept coming back was this Apollo image from the late 60s. It's actually a composite um, image of the Earth at night. And I was really struck as I traveled in the north about how many of us have taken our laws, our policies, our good ideas into the, well, to the edges of the earth, whether it's the center of the equatorial rainforest, but particularly to the north. The northerners have suffered the brunt or the genius of people who have brought light into their world. Um, and the, 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 uh, the powerful uh, uh, sort of learning or teaching that that emerged from from my journey around the world was that uh, it's high time we really did turn the idea of <clears throat> taking uh, our enlightenment into the world into the edges of the world and turned the idea upside down and started thinking instead about ways to bask in the light of the people who, who live there and uh, in fact I've thought a lot about the light that we bask in, or the light that is ours, um, metaphoric and otherwise. And uh, I often think, uh, increasingly, of us driving down the highway of life, you know, and even on a spectacular night when Orion is right there on the horizon, we're still kind of stuck in the cone of our own light. And what do we find in there? Well, we find ourselves and all the, our views of the world. And of course, when you put a screen around that, that just makes it kind of even more of an echo chamber where it really is difficult to get a sense that there are other perspectives in the world. And when, in fact, as my journey and perhaps your journeys to uh, out-of-the-way places have shown you, that if you turn off the light, you'll actually find in the darkness some very key concepts. And I think they're key concepts that we need as much as anything right now. And uh, I want to use that idea of of what we, who we are and what we are inside our cone of light, that cone of privilege uh, set against uh, what's outside that cone as a kind of an organizing idea for this presentation. And I, I really just want to sort of break it into three bits, three acts if you like. Act one is really bears in the light. And polar bears are well known to us. And you say, well, I've never seen a polar bear. Well, I beg to differ. <laughs> They've been used to sell everything from cough drops to cars uh, to conservation to consulting and on and on and on from Jell-O all the way through to my friends at Adventure Canada who've chosen to use the proud polar bear as a, an icon for, um, for marketing uh, trips to the north, which is completely apt. And then, that, then of course, there's Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola um, has employed Santa and penguins, but they've done also very well uh, by teaming up with the World Wildlife Fund. And um, bears have been drinking Coke for quite a long time. And uh, in fact, Coke uh, with the World Wildlife Fund um, had a number of years ago, they put polar bears on the cans of, uh, of various products around the world and um, had a website called Arctic Home. And uh, that was an initiative to um, help conservation through the consumption of pop. And 
uh, for whatever the virtues of uh, Koch's uh, uh, project to to team up in a conservation with a conservation organization, there are those who would who would damn them. So Koch, the bears are very much a part of it. And after 40 years of traveling in the north, I've met the odd bear here and there. Um, uh, from Franz Joseph Land on the way to the North Pole to uh, Peel Sound, um, which was on the ice uh, west of Somerset Island in the Northwest Passage. And uh, I'm sorry, I haven't put any maps in here. Uh, I did hear from many of you uh, after the first episode uh, with uh, uh, comments and uh, constructive uh, criticism. And one of the things you've asked for is uh, is more sense of where where some of the places are um, that I'm talking about. But what I would like to offer you here is uh, because the recording uh, will come back to you uh, after this presentation, if you're interested in knowing where Franz Joseph Land is, I've put the names in so that you can actually just Google those on Google Earth and you'll find out uh, where those are. But other places from Monument Island, which is an island out in the uh, mouth of uh, Baffin Bay, and uh, to Wager Bay. Um, and actually, I've just written a column remembering a, a trip back there in kayaks in 1986 when I had a bit of an out-of-body experience uh, with bears. Fascinating creatures, but they, they're no, they turn up in the wild for sure, but they also turn up in the damnedest other places, from hotels in the Sahara Republic to the airport in Repulse Bay, uh, the Arctic Circle Pavilion in Norway, this bear smelled a bit like uh, like lavender, and actually reminded me a lot of a bear that's um, similarly disposed uh, part way up the stairs at the Explorers Club in New York City. Um, pretty pretty ferocious. Less ferocious bears I've met uh, all over the place in Oslo, in uh, Chicago, in Reykjavik, Iceland, at the uh, first meeting of the Arctic Circle, hosted by Olaf Ragnar Grimson. These were uh, very clever. Uh, mostly Finnish um, protesters who came to that meeting um, to bring the natural world into those discussions and they used those bears quite creatively. I actually met a bunch of the bears after a while. Uh, but uh, more polar bears, there they are doing a salutation of the sun in Reykjavik outside Harpa, the, uh, the big uh, beautiful uh, uh, opera house there. These happy guys were at the North American Fur Auction in Toronto. Um, a strange and wonderful place, but that's where trappers, indigenous people, sell their furs. And um, sadly, or maybe predictably, the North American Fur Auction has had a hard time um, making ends meet. And uh, they're actually, I think, under bankruptcy protection at the moment. But it's uh, it's quite a place and polar bears in amongst uh, all sorts of other fur bearing animals figure largely there. Uh, most of you probably haven't been to the North American Fur Auction. But I tell you, if you want to see bears in the wild, besides going to Churchill and to one of the operators there in the fall, which is an amazing place to see polar bears. The orphan bears from Churchill are taken to the Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg, and I would really, really strongly recommend. I mean, if whatever you think about zoos, it's an amazing place to get close to polar bears. I have to say, polar bears are really one of the most amazing creatures. They can function and hunt in total darkness. They can function and hunt in 24-hour light. They are creatures of the ice, but as the ice season is shorter, they are also creatures of the land, particularly, well, more and more and more. Some bears are on the ice uh, year-round, um, but when they're on the land, they don't eat. And that in itself is a pretty remarkable um, uh, characteristic of this, this beautiful animal. Um, their yearly round uh, is complex, um, like any other species. Um, they have a whole life cycle from birth to death that is informed by the movement of the earth around the sun. And uh, they have really quite uh, uh, an elaborate um, 
way of living that is really not captured in the Jello ads. I mean, they, it's as if they're there on the ice and that's what they do, but they have really a complex. In fact, there are 19 subpopulations of bears that have been identified in the world. Most of them are in Canada. And in those 19 subpopulations are between 20 and 30,000 bears. Are they endangered? Um, it depends what country you go to. Um, they have the highest, um, they're threatened uh, in some jurisdictions. In other jurisdictions, uh, they're, they're a watch species. Um, but um, there are some fantastic uh, websites out there from Polar Bears International to the World Wildlife Fund. I mean, they're, they're play if you want to go and learn about the natural history of bears, I'd strongly recommend. There are some wonderful places. This, uh, this beautiful map comes from Canadian Geographic and the cartographers there, and there's, a, there's a, a quite a bit of good uh, reporting on bears in, in Canadian Geographic as well. But um, my purpose in this presentation is to, with the light and dark thing, uh, illuminated a cone of light versus what's going on outside that. My purpose in this is actually to celebrate the bear but also to look at the ways in which bears are configured in the darker outside of our cone of light. But the one thing I wanted to say is of all the amazing things about, about bears, I mean to say nothing of when it's minus 40 outside and they're walking on the ice, it's plus 37 inside them like us. Um, I think it's amazing that in that space, that one centimeter space of skin between the minus 40 ice and the plus 37 body, in that one centimeter is a transition of nearly 80 degrees cent centigrade and still the bears are able to function. They don't freeze their feet. Uh, uh, anyway, um, this is something that you might not have thought about, but um, I just want to say, look, when we burn things, have a campfire, you take fuel, you add oxygen, it produces carbon dioxide and water. Um, you probably learned that in, in school, and of course energy um, in the form of heat and light in the case of a campfire. Well, I don't know if you've ever wondered, but polar bears live by and large on salt water, and yes, the ice that they walk on because of the way ice works on salt water. The ice is largely fresh. If you've ever been out and wanted to make tea uh, on, on ice like that, you can actually just boil up the ice, melt the ice, and you can make tea. It's morally fresh. But fresh water is not available, uh, by and large, in a polar bear's habitat. And uh, they also have a combustion equation. They eat seals, bearded seals and ring seals mostly, and they, they, they eat them mostly for their fat which produces fat on the bear. And of course, the longer the season, the more fat they, the, the season of hunting, the more fat they can generate. But uh, polar bears uh, burn fat by, they breathe it, breathe in the oxygen they can, they, that they get out of the air. And what does that do? Just like the campfire, it produces carbon dioxide and water. And of course, a ton of energy as well. But what's interesting about that is that it's actually metabolic water that serves most polar bears water needs and uh, so in the dead of winter when it's dry 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 in the air and there's no fresh water liquid fresh water available by eating fat they can actually live like that fascinating um, but all is not well for polar bears and although the scientists um, agree um, that a shortening season of ice when the hunting is absolutely best means that bears will not hunt as much, they will not bring up, uh, they will not get as, as much food stores or fat uh, prepared for the time than they're on land when they don't eat very much at all. Hunting um, when the ice isn't there is a very difficult proposition, it's a much more energy expensive proposition. And uh, I want to use the rest of this presentation to do what the Russian Geographical Society did with that iconic image. And uh, that says in Russian, uh, simply, uh, think about it. <laughs> and uh, this is maybe where, where we move away from natural history and into uh, a kind of another, another take on, on bears that leads us to, uh, to Icewalker. 
So Act Two, Bears in the Dark. Now, during, um, well, over the last decade or so, I think it's fair to say that a lot of people are looking north because of climate change. And when people look north, the image that comes back is very often an image of a polar bear, often drinking Coca-Cola, in an unpeopled wilderness. And uh, as I said in episode one, um, the north is not an unpeopled place. In fact, there are four million people at or above the Arctic Circle. So, but that's not what I want to say here. Uh, I want to say that the conclusion I drew uh, at the uh, in encircling the midnight sun is that, you know, the more we look north and the more we see these bears, um, the more they're kind of etched on our consciousness, and probably never more memorably than in uh, Al Gore's uh, epic film. An Inconvenient Truth with this uh, animated sequence of a bear swimming around in a, a warming ocean looking for a place to call home. Now that was contentious at the time and we could talk about uh, more about that. Um, it, I, I just want to raise that to say that at the end of my journey around the world I, I, that was reported in Circling the Midnight Sun is uh, We Are the Bear. And uh, it really was, struck me quite s substantially that we are, you know, swimming around in a soup, warming soup of our own, own making, looking for a place to call home. But uh, I want to come back to the bear. Uh, I mean, We Are the Bear was the last line of that book. And uh, interestingly, uh, a potter in Nova Scotia read the book as well. And I couldn't believe it. I went to... Uh, uh, a juried art show in Oxford, Nova Scotia, and saw this amazing, it's actually uh, about uh, half a meter by a meter and a half. Uh, I think there are 182 pieces of ceramic pottery in there. And uh, the title of that piece, based on Circling the Midnight Sun, is We Are the Bear. And uh, that was Jen Hotalling's uh, take on the book. And uh, it's, uh, it's a beguiling, beguiling piece of art. But the notion that we are the bear and that bears are etched into our consciousness is not something we should be, we should apologize for. I mean, it's written into the sort of cultural DNA of Western people. And when you think about the night sky that we've all seen, I mean, one of the first constellations, maybe the only constellations that we're cognizant of is the Big Dipper or Ursa Major, the, the bear. And of course that leads to the pole star with the little dipper or the little bear there. And in fact, Arctic, originally from Greek, comes from Arcticos, which means the home of the bear. So bear sort of stands for some aspect of Arctic and it's, it's ingrained in our consciousness. But there are other views of what bears mean, and they uh, became really apparent to me as I traveled and lived with people at the north during during circling the midnight sun. But I think I want to just tell you step sideways a little bit here, and tell you that I think the first inkling that there was more to bears than sort of science and beauty and power and um, charisma, uh, that there was more to bears, uh, I think probably came to me at a major turning point in my life that began here at the University of Guelph. Um, I think I may have said in episode one that one of my great desires as a kid, I read I wanted to be a marine biologist and uh, I wanted to work in the north. and. Um, as a result of that desire, I studied biology, and um, one thing led to another, and as a very young person entering the world of science and academe, um, I ended up working uh, on a project at the University of Guelph um, that was, was life-changing for me. Um, uh, and uh, just as a kind of a fun thing to do, um, I've carried this with me since the mid-70s, but uh, never really had to articulate what happened uh, at the University of Guelph 
in the mid 70s until I got an invitation, a very nice invitation from the principal um, of the university to come and talk, give a talk to the graduating class at the College of Biological Sciences. And um, I thought, ooh, um, anyway, um, I duly showed up at the university a couple of years ago and uh, <laughs> had to say it's a wonderful thing that you, uh, you've done here, but uh, I, I, I quit, uh, I came here. Anyway, here, here's just a little snippet of, um, of what I said to them in Memorial Hall uh, at U of G. Truth be told, although I live away from Guelph, my hometown, I can't be in this place without fondly thinking and remembering a big male polar bear called Huxley and a series of formative experiences here at the College of Biological Sciences. In spite of doing my undergrad at an unnamed university with red gowns down 401, I began here as a seal handler in training which I gather was an apt acronym for a man such as myself. By degrees, though, I graduated from feeding and bleeding seals to a vision research project involving Huxley that happened in the lab animal building just across the street. And there were two significant outcomes of that study. One was a paper in the Journal of Biochemistry and Physiology called The Spectral Sensitivity of a Polar Bear. And the second possibly equally seismic consequence of that study for science was my exit from the discipline. <laughs> Huxley helped me see that my gifts, such as they were, were far less suited to lab-based investigations of the North than they were to more field-based research, writing, and teaching in the North that curved away from the bedrock of science to the landscape of cultural anthropology and geography. Well, <laughs> yeah, I had to fess up. The science was amazing. Here's my colleague John Lee, uh, who, I mean, essentially what happens is you shone a light in the bear's eye, and if the bear saw it, he was trained, operantly conditioned to press a paddle to say, yes, I see it, or if he didn't see it, he said no. And what you end up with is a graph of the spectrum, the color of light versus how light, how bright the light has to be before the bear can see it. And you, you end up with a pretty interesting curve that perhaps not surprisingly has uh, a spike of acuity in the blue-green spectrum, which may be uh, talks to fishing on or hunting underwater, it might speak to darkness. Um, the science was, was amazing. But what happened, I mean, I spent weeks, months, often in the pitch dark with that bear, and there was a connection to that living being, that majestic living being, that I couldn't shake. I couldn't just put on my lab coat and go in there and, I mean, once a month we had to uh, take blood from him and at first we tried a jab stick. Um, it's kind of a long story of where he came from. I mean, he was one of the uh, so-called problem bears in Churchill who'd been jailed because he kept coming into town in the fall and harassing people and he was eventually co-opted into an energetic study with one of my colleagues in, at the university and after he'd done the energetic study run on a treadmill he was no longer afraid of people and so he went to the Toronto Zoo and he wasn't the best zoo bear um, so uh, Dr. Keith Ronald, my supervisor, um, was told by the zoo that they needed, he needed to get this bear out of there, and so he brought the bear to the University of Guelph. But we used to, I mean, originally in the cage, uh, which was probably three meters by four meters by a meter and a half high, we used to, we started trying to anesthetize him with a jab stick or a syringe on the end of a pole, but that didn't work. So once a month, I basically had to shoot this bear point blank with a tranquilizer rifle. And, um, and go in there and, and do that, but I, I just after a while I just I, I couldn't do it anymore. And um, one of the really strange consequences of 
going there to get an honorary doctorate was they said, you know, if there's anything you want to do at the university, which was incredible because the university is doing some amazing work, particularly on DNA barcoding and yeah, amazing. But uh, I said, yeah, I, I worked on this bear back in the 70s and I've, I've heard that he, he, he might be a rug now or something. I, is there any way I could see that bear? And the principal's uh, executive assistant said, well, I don't know anything about that. But anyway, uh, just near before I went to the uh, the actual event, it was something was three days at the university, um, this appointment showed up at 3.30 to go to the lab animal building and the vertebrate anatomy lab. And sure enough, there was Huxley. And I knew it was Huxley um, for reasons that he had a cage routine and then he used to bang his hand, feet on the bars like primates, bears develop these, like basic, I think he was basically going nuts in the cage, but um, that's not a scientist talking, that, I, anyway, uh, that was a, that was a surreal, surreal moment, um, but I want to, so I got the sense that there was more to this bear than simply uh, an amalgam of physiological processes and a natural history and a, yeah, the, that there was, there was something more energetically, psychically going on with bears. And clearly one of the things that happened during circling the midnight sun is I went into the field, as it were, with the notion that bears and people are separate things. And I would, well, they would, um, yeah, I mean, I thought bears and people were were different. But it turned out that the people I met throughout the circumpolar world, particularly indigenous people, didn't have the same cut and dried categories. That in fact, the line between bears and people was a little bit, more pliable or plastic than the discrete categories that I had taken to this. And in fact, uh, I often thought of Huxley and my relationship with this bear that I didn't really figure it out. But in going around the world, I, I, I ran into people and I would explain, you know, I said, you know, that everybody's looking north and the images that come back are of polar bears in an unpeopled wilderness. It's not an unpeopled wilderness. And finally, as I was talking to people, um, reading, but also just chatting, um, finally a lady took me by the hand, Zoya in the bottom corner there, and she said, you know, we were bears once, and we'll probably be bears again. <laughs> she said, so the, diff you know, uh, the bears and people, uh, we were sort of one, and that, was kind of echoed in some really interesting ways. Um, in uh, Seliyadavo, um, on a tributary of the Ob River, I happened to be there at the time of the Bear Festival, and there's a, there's a whole dance. I mean, typically there would be a hunt involved, um, and there's a whole dance where most of the dancers cover their heads uh, out of respect for the bear, but they also don't want the bear to see who they are, who are involved. Because it's, and I don't want to simplify what's going on here. I want to just raise the idea that bear is not to many, many people of the north is not just meat or not just. It's actually a co-dweller of a very integrated and complex universe. And the more I learned, the more I realized. I mean, here's the night sky. And there's the Big Dipper standing there, sort of in the top left quadrant, standing on his head, the pot or the bear. And uh, there's Orion down at the bottom, which is one of our gorgeous winter constellations. And then the Hyades, if you follow uh, to the north or up and to, to, to the right a bit from Orion at the bottom, you come into the Hyades and then the Pleiades. Well, it never dawned on me that what I thought was the bear was actually to some different people they're caribou. So the Big Dipper are caribou. It's not a, not a bear to to Inuit in particular. And then in fact um, the Hyades, which just they rise just above 
uh, above Orion in the night sky. <clears throat> That's actually Nenurjuk and Kimmet, the, the dogs and a bear running in the night sky. And by degrees, it really dawned on me and it's, I started to go back to some of the stories that had been told to Nudras Musen, to Diamond Janess, to Willemar Stephenson, um, that were, I had, in, in the first instance when I had read these stories, I thought, oh, that's kind of cute, you know, about the woman who became uh, a bear, or a bear who became a woman, and about the hunt that went into the sky, and um, I started to realize that there was actually a whole cosmology here uh, of ways in which bears and people are integrated far, far more than us taxonomists would would let on. And in fact that the relationship between people and bears, which is as old as time in the circumpolar world, uh, is, a t is a relationship about codependence, co-living, and um, it goes on. And so when we think about, we people with the light think about uh, conservation, so often we think about the bears in a kind of um, separate category, worrying about climate change and that sort of thing, but they're not a separate category for people of the north. They're actually part of a living, breathing uh, system of interrelationships and energy transfers and uh, and that goes on today. I mean, for those of you who follow my uh, my Instagram channel uh, a week or so ago, uh, my friend uh, Jonathan Pitsulak and Mitzmatzelik up in Pond Inlet, um, uh, two epic rites of passage happened to him during the COVID thing here. He graduated from college with an environmental technician's uh, a diploma, which is amazing, but he also got his, his first polar bear and uh, as a result can uh, sing his Aya songs with his drum differently. But the pictures that he put on Facebook, uh, you know, in 2020 uh, during the COVID of not only the hunt of the bear, which I'm not going to put on here, but he it shows um, a number of women in his family sitting around inside a home scraping the hide. It shows a feast. It shows an integration of people and bears like nothing you would find on the pages of any kind of conservation uh, journal. And um, I think that's, in, if we are to, to understand and to move forward in our relationship with the natural, natural world, the original premise of me going north for circling the midnight sun is there was wisdom in the north uh, that could come to bear on what, what we do. And I think one of the things that could come to bear is this notion of categories and what we might do to rethink them. This is also on Instagram, but it's one of the Horwood collection at the, at the museum, uh, Canadian Canoe Museum. But, you know, I've often wondered if carvers, what they, you know, with the world that they occupy is different. So here's a dancing polar bear. Um, by an amazing carver, but uh, and you can learn more about that on my Instagram. But th that a bear might dance is kind of whimsical. Um, maybe sell well um, at a southern uh, soapstone gallery. But uh, I don't have a lot of soapstone. But one of the soapstone characters that I do have is one that a little boy sold me on the uh, on the beach a long, long time ago, the beach at Repulse Bay, and, and I don't know who made this, but I originally thought it was a bear, and I put it in my hand, and it's the most beguiling thing, and it looks like a bear, uh, um, it sort of walks like a bear, but it's, it's wearing uh, uh, clothing, and uh, if you actually look at that, and I'm, I know this is a bit weird, but I put it on a piece of window glass and shot up underneath. Um, it's actually a person, and the notion that bears and people are a more fluid kind of relationship, mythologically, epistemologically, um, that to me is intriguing. And that to me uh, talks about conservation and the concept in the context of cultural preservation as well as climate change. And uh, it's a complex world. Finally, I just want to say we're 
uh, I went with all of this. So, you know, the time that we live in is called the Anthropocene, and um, uh, Edward Tinsky and his colleagues have made an amazing film about this, but a time um, that would suggest human activities are finally actually shaping the environment uh, as a distinct geological age. And uh, I thought, boy, if I'm going to do another book after Circling the Midnight Sun, I would really like to produce something that would, um, that would make the world better and not worse. But in the meantime, I started working with filmmakers um, as a writer, a uh, script writer. And um, I figured something out from that. And uh, I'll, I'll show you one uh, film by Jason Van Bruggen. Um, he asked me if I would write a love letter to the Arctic, and it became a very short film that opened the uh, Arctic Film Festival at the Explorers Club in New York City a couple of years ago. Uh, but I'll just say uh, it was an interesting challenge for me. You know, I know a lot about the North, but here's a guy saying, no, write a love letter to the North. Well, here it is. The North. The heart of human imaginings. whose margin fades forever and forever. Where stories are made. We bend to the columns of our dreams, always moving toward uncertainty. Searching Searching for truth in the grace, beauty, and ferocity of all we have seen. That is the adventurer's call to know that the one we eventually find and overtake at journey's end is the searching soul we left behind out here in the last wild place. Oh, Jason, remarkable filmmaker. But working with him and other filmmakers, and I'm going to show you another example, um, I finally realized, and this notion was sown by uh, Bill Mason when I was doing a biography of him many years ago. Bill always said that you're, you should be 90% story and maybe 10% message, never more. But what I realized working with artists like Jason Van Bruggen and Go Iromoto, which I'm going to show you in a sec, is that these storytellers aren't aiming at your head, which I think I had been doing a lot of my books, you know, rational arguments about how the world works and how you might find your place in it. Instead, I think they were aiming at people's hearts. And um, uh, that combination of image, sound, and ideas uh, that goes in here first, I think it has a huge potential to change people's behavior, to get them to act differently. And um, well, I'll just show you another example. Go Iromoto is a young filmmaker um, who was tasked by the Ontario government to promote Ontario. In, in the UK and decided to do it with canoes and asked me if I would uh, if I would do a script and here's a trailer for what became a, a bigger a bigger feature film um, but it gets it similarly it's kind of a love letter to the canoe To travel by canoe is to ponder where we came from, where we are, where we're going, who we were, who we are, and who we can be. Suspended between the world above and the world below, stillness in harmonic motion, these are the paddle's promises. To paddle is to plug into the energies of the place, the land, the air, the water, the ancestors, the children who are yet to be born. The paddle connects us to all of that. To pull is to connect to the river itself, but also to the lands it nourishes. To be there, to be connected, 
as a mix of Canadians new and old. If it is love that binds people to places in this nation of rivers and in this river of nations, then one enduring expression of that simple truth is surely the canoe. Uh, that last sequence is shot uh, about 100 meters from here out on Cranberry Lake. So uh, I have spent most of my life writing nonfiction, that's what sells, and um, it's aimed at, at people's heads and uh, working with these filmmakers and thinking about the Anthropocene and what we've done to the earth, thinking about Huxley. Um, I, I thought, gee whiz, if I'm going to write another book, um, I would really like to aim it at people's hearts as much as their heads, and uh, that's where Ice Walker came from. It's a portrait of humanity in 24 months in the life of a female polar bear in Hudson Bay, southwestern Hudson Bay, and um, um, it's interesting, I uh, signed the book in uh, April of 2016, and it takes a long time to write a short book. It's um, it's really meant to be uh, a story about a bear, so you get to meet a bear. I didn't want the bear to talk. I didn't want it to be a Disney bear, but I wanted you to get uh, connected to the bear who encounters all of the crazy things that are happening in her world. And uh, I'd just like to finish by, uh, by reading you a little bit of, um, of the introduction. Um, by way of saying thank you for uh, for joining us, and uh, but uh, here, let me uh, try a little bit of this. Imagine you're in the International Space Station, curving over North America. From the heavens, Hudson Bay looks like an enormous paw print on the torso of the continent, a massive beating heart drawing lifeblood from a vast network of lakes and rivers that drain nearly 1.5 million square miles of what is now the United States and Canada. At the estuaries of all the great rivers that flow into the bay, fresh water and seawater mix and begin to swirl in a great counterclockwise gyre that freezes and thaws, contracts and releases as the earth makes its way around the sun. Daily tides impelled by the moon and swayed by the movement of the earth pulse the big bay in sinus rhythm. In the spring, great flows of ice pump rhythmically through Hudson Strait into the Labrador Current and on into global oceanic circulation. Mists rising off those same waters are energized by the sun. They rise and swirl at the atmosphere, eventually returning to earth as rain or snow on the high ground, where the cycle is renewed. Now imagine, in the middle of all that pulsing, renewing energy, a seven-year-old polar bear striding into an uncertain future as another 24 months in the Arctic unfold. In Canada, the Cree to the south call her Wabusk. The Inuit to the north call her Nanook. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's a story about Ice Walker. It's episode two. Um, I'm delighted to be able to uh, connect with you on behalf of my friends at Adventure Canada with Inside and Explorer's Arctic Journal and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, any feedback you have, uh, I'd be delighted to hear it. I know Adventure Canada, we've got a contest running this time around um, that I hope you'll uh, take advantage of that involves uh, a credit on a future Adventure Canada trip and one of these uh, coveted uh, 
advanced readers copies of the book. The book itself is coming out in uh, in September. And uh, next time, episode three uh, is called "The Idea of North," and um, uh, that uh, picks up on a classic radio documentary done by Glenn Gould and finishes with uh, what would be the Sealy's Bay equivalent of a of a rock video. I do uh, would love to connect with you on Instagram. I'm Raf Jam, or on my website, or on Facebook, um, and of course. Do stay connected with Adventure Canada. We're not running any uh, shipbound trips in the COVID time, but uh, great, great plans for 21. Hope you'll join us. Bye for now.